joy it is to gather with you this year again. Is anyone here for the first time? Yeah. Oh, wow. Lots of joining. I want to take a moment and introduce you to someone that I just met five minutes ago. His name is Loy Williamson. Raise, wave at us, Loy. He, his great-grandfather in 1906 rented this house right after the first assembly and then purchased it the following year and it was in his family until about the early 40s when uh, the Tomlinsons came and snatched it away again. So he's joining us and it is just a blessing to have you with us, Brother Williams. So. If you need a bathroom, there's one along the tree line. It's not the tree, it's actually a port john uh, But some have already said I can wait, so. But it is there if you need it. Uh, after service, we will, as we usually do, take a group picture. I don't know if we'll do it up here or on the porch. Do you, do you, we'll do it on the porch. So stick around for just a minute as soon as we're done, and we'll get that picture. And then lunch will be available at Fields of the Wood for $8.99. Uh, I know they're serving pulled pork and rice and beans from uh, Magali, who's a wonderful cook. Uh, and I think there may be a few other options. I'm not sure, but I know that's available. So we hope you'll join us there as well. I want to open today with uh, a gift that we put together. We've had some of these from years past, and what we have is a collection of coins that highlight some of our history, and uh, I'd like to give it to the person who has been serving Jesus the longest, <laughs> if we can dissect that. So if, has anyone been serving the Lord more than 50 years? Raise your hand. All right, wow. Of course. 60, let's go there next. Okay, we narrowed it a little. Uh, 70? Serving the Lord for 70 years. All right. Is it just Brother Williamson? All right. Well, yeah. Are you sure? All right, well, let's, let's drop it down to 69. There we are. All right. Sixty-nine years serving the Lord. That's a legacy. It's always a blessing to join you on this day as we celebrate the very first assembly uh, of, of our movement. Um, in 1906, it happened right here in this room with just a handful of people. You have a program. Let me introduce you to the people that you'll be hearing from. Uh, I won't get up again as we move forward until the end. So. Uh, You'll first be hearing from uh, Brother Wilson Ordonez, Michael Wilson Ordonez. He is our Heritage Ministries Coordinator in the state of California, and he flew out just to be here today for this service, so we're glad to have him. <laughs> Eric Boston will lead a few songs today. He's up here on my right. He uh, is on staff as our Park Planning Advisor, and uh, he is the guy who redid the Bible, a Top Ten Commandment Mountain, what, about two years ago now? And uh, when you look up there and see it glowing in the backdrop of the beautiful blue sky, uh, Eric did that and worked diligently on that, and he still helps us in many ways at the park regularly. Uh, in fact, just this week we put up brand new signage on the front of the arch. Uh, you'll notice it as you come in, the fields of the wood and the, the scepter, the cross, and the crown. Uh, we just redid that this week. The old ones were actually falling off. So. <laughs> so he took care of that, and any signage you see or anything that looks new around the park probably came. Uh, from Eric, so we're thankful to have him be a part. Then you'll hear from Bishop Adrian Barlack, uh, up here in the front, no stranger to us. He uh, will be sharing about some of the history from a historical standpoint. He's our church historian for the Church of God of Prophecy. Then you'll finally hear from Bishop Harold Parker, up here on my left. He is a, let me get it all right, a retired overseer now. Um, he was formerly press administrator at White Wing Publishing House a few years ago. He's pastored in Michigan, Colorado, Maryland, and Ohio for over 21 years total. And then he turned to being a state overseer in Ohio, West Virginia, and landing in Mississippi and Louisiana before ret retiring with his wife, Jerry, who's here as well, in 2013, and they have settled in Cleveland. And uh, as I was praying about who I'd share this, this day, I could not get Brother Parker out of my mind. So I'm thrilled to have him with us, and I know he has a word for God, for you. 114 years ago this week, specifically January 26, 27, 1906, a few men, faithful men and women sat right here <coughs> trying to find the will of God. Today, I hope you're not here for an event. They hadn't shown up for an event. They showed up for a meeting, not only with one another, but for a meeting with God. Amen. 
Yeah. And so, although I went to Facebook and created an event for today, because that's the only option they gave me, I don't see it as an event, I still see it as a meeting. A meeting for one another and still a meeting with God. And I don't believe anyone here is here by chance today. You're here for a divine appointment. So I begin simply by asking you today, what do you need from God? Because we're here to meet with Him. We're here to hear from Him. We're here to experience His presence and be reminded that He has moved the same yesterday, today, forever. He will move the same. And He'll do it today as He did 114 years ago in your life and for the future of our movement and the future of our lives. So what do you need God to do today? Would you take a moment to stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the history of the place where we're standing. God, we understand that it's not historical because the same wood is on the walls that they saw 114 years ago. It's a historic place because you showed up in this room 114 years ago. And you started something that is still burning this very day and now around the globe. And so, Lord, we pray you'd light a wick in our hearts as you lit a wick in there. And that it would, the, the, the things that you light in our lives today, I pray they'd still be burning 114 years from this day, Lord. I pray for healing to come. I pray for direction to come. I pray for answered prayers to come this very day, Lord. And I pray your presence would be shown and your presence would be known, O oh God. We open our hearts to you and our lives to you. And Lord, may you be magnified and glorified this day. Hallelujah. Bless your holy name, O oh Lord. Praise your name and greatly to be praised. Oh, bless you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Wilson is coming to read the minutes from that first sentence. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. It is a great honor and a blessing to be here. This has always been my dream to be in this meeting. Um, so I want to thank the Lord for that opportunity that He gives me today. We'll be reading the minutes of the First Assembly. The meeting called to order and devotions conducted by Pastor A.J. Tomlinson. After due consideration, the assembly accepted the following motto or ruling. We do not consider ourselves a legislative or executive body, but judicial only. The question as to whether records should be made and preserved to this and other assemblies was duly discussed by Deacon J.C. Murphy and others, passed upon and recommended as scriptural. The assembly discussed the advisability of each local church making and preserving its own records, considered in harmony with the New Testament teaching, and advised each local church to make and preserve records of all church proceedings, the Acts of the Apostles as examples. Communion and feet washing were duly discussed by Elder R.J. Sperling and others, and it is the sense of this assembly that the communion and feet washing are taught by the New Testament scriptures and may be engaged in at the same service or at different times at the option of the local churches in order to preserve the unity of the body and to obey the sacred word we recommend that every member engage in these sacred services we further recommend that these holy ordinances be observed one or more times is each year. Prayer meetings discussed by Alexander Hamby and others. It is therefore the sense of this assembly that we recommend, advise, and urge that each local church hold a prayer meeting at least once a week. We recommend further that someone in every church who may feel led by the Holy Spirit or selected by the church Take oversight, therefore, 
and see that such prayer meetings be held regularly and in proper order. Evangelism, discussed by the pastor and others, reports of the work done in, in past year, consecration on the part of a number. After the consideration of the ripened fields and open doors for evangelism this year, strong men wept and said they were not only willing but ready and anxious to go. It is therefore the sense of this meeting that we do our best to press into every open door this year and work with greater zeal and energy for the spread of the glorious gospel of the Son of God than ever before. A discourse on the use of tobacco was delivered by evangelist M. S. Lemons and discussed by others. After due consideration, this assembly agreed to stand with one accord in opposition to the use of tobacco in any form. It is offensive to those who do not use it, weakens and impairs the nervous system, and near relative to drunkenness, bad influence and example to the young, useless expense, the money for which ought to be used to clothe the poor, spread the gospel, or make the homes of our country more comfortable. And we last believe that its use is contrary to the teaching of the scripture, and as Christ is our example, we cannot believe that he would use it in any form or under any circumstances. We further recommend and advise that the ministers and deacons of each church make a special effort to use their influence against its use. Deal tenderly and lovingly with those in the church who, who use it, but insist that an affectionate spirit and its use to be dis discontinued as much as possible. We also advise the deacons to secure a report at the close of each year of the number who have been in, induced to discontinue the habit and deliver from a desire of it. Also, the number to continue to use and carry such reports to the General Assembly. Family worship was discussed by Andrew Freeman and others. It is therefore the sense of this assembly that we recommend and urge that families of all the churches engage in this very sacred and important service at least once a day, at a time most convenient to the household, and that the parents should see that every child is taught as early as possible to reverence God and their parents by listening quietly and attentively to the reading of God's Word and getting down on their knees during the prayer. We recommend further that the ministers and deacons of each church use their influence and make special effort to encourage every family in the church to engage in this devotional exercise every day. And that the deacons ascertain in the proper information to make a report of the number of families that have been induced to take up this service during the year. The number that make it a regular practice and those that do not and carry such report to the yearly or general assembly. The Sunday school was briefly discussed by Elder W. F. Bryant, Masali Murphy, and others. We highly favor this important service as the means to teach the children to reverence God's Word and the household appointed for worship, and also to elevate the morals of our community. It is therefore a sense of this assembly to recommend, advise, and urge every local church to have a Sunday school every Sunday during the whole year if possible. We advise the workers to do all they can to propagate the Sunday school interests and search for places where they are where there are none and organize where it is possible to do so. We believe a Sunday school may sometimes be organized and run successfully where a church could not be established, established at once, thereby opening and paving the way for more permanent work in the future. It is further recommended that Sunday school be held in the forenoon when it is possible to hold them at, at that time. 
When a member in good standing removes from the vicinity of one church to another, we recommend that a letter of recommendation be given them on request in harmony with Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. We commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. We recommend a closer union and fellowship of all the churches. We therefore conclude an assembly composed of elders and chosen men and the women from each church once a year to be of vast importance for the promotion of the gospel of Christ and His church. We therefore, with one accord, select and set apart Thursday, Friday, and Saturday before the second Saturday in January of each year for this special yearly assembly, provided, however, that there are no preventing providences. The place to be selected later as the provinces of God and His Spirit may direct. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us, being assembled together with one accord, with the Spirit of Christ in the midst, and after much prayer, discussion, searching the scripture, Scriptures and counsel, we recommend these necessary things, and that they be ratified and observed by all the local churches. It is the duty of the church to execute the laws given us by Christ through His holy apostles. The assembly concluded Saturday, January 27, 1906 at 7.30 p.m. Would you stand with me? We've heard an account of a meeting that was anointed, and it has passed. We have gathered here today for a meeting, and it too will pass. But one day, our eyes will be open. Time will be no more. And it will never end as we see our Jesus face to face. Will you join with me as we sing when we all get to heaven? The words are printed in, in your bulletin. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place, oh yes, when we all get to heaven. What a day! A rejoicing that will be.
indeed going to be a great and grand occasion. Amen. The world has never experienced anything like it, cannot do so until Christ returns. Brother Darren, Mr. Parker, Mr. Clements, all the brethren that are here, we greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a few remarks this morning regarding some things that transpired uh, in our history, and I have prepared it so that I can read it rather quickly, but I would like you to pay close attention. I've titled it, Historical Connections, Recognizing the Unlimited Horizons of the Holy Spirit. Seven years after the First Assembly, of the fledgling churches of East Tennessee, North Georgia, and Western North Carolina, associated with the Holiness Church at Camp Creek. In the year 1913, Bishop A.J. Thomason sat down to write what would become his magnum opus, or his largest literary work that he wrote, and he titled it, The Last Great Conflict. The book reflected his views on several wide-ranging topics, such as abounding love, the world is lost, joy and rejoicing. You need some writings on that today, some joy and rejoicing. <laughs> so much down-in-the-mouth things we hear all the time nowadays. We need some joy and rejoicing. Amen. The Holy Ghost and the evidence of his baptism, healing in the atonement, the Church of God, Prevailing Prayer, and some others. In his brief preface, he addressed the book, as he wrote, to those who need instruction and to those who need stimulation and inspiration. The scope and focus of the book can be said to be eschatological, meaning he is looking towards the end time. And that's why he is using the title, The Last Great Conflict. And because of that focus, of course, he is writing to try to stimulate and inspire others. The bishop appealed in the last part of the book in this way. He spoke about the warfare against sin and Satan, and he appealed for a million men who would fear nothing but God, filled with such holy zeal and godly courage, that we could together burst forth under the power of this mighty baptism, or this baptismal fire, and rush to every quarter of the globe like madmen, declaring the gospel of the Son of God, until every tribe, kindred, tongue, and people could hear and thus end this last great conflict. It would be interesting, I'm sure, for Bishop A.J. to stand here today and count the number of different people and countries and uh, locations represented in this meeting this morning. I know it would be a blessing to him if he was here, but he's more blessed where he is. You would agree, eh? Amen. This sense of moving steadily forward towards the end of all things through our growing and changing understanding and development of the church and its mission is evident in the late Bishop M. A. Tomlinson's footnote which he added to his father's preface. He wrote, the author A. J. Tomlinson was a man of progressive vision. He constantly and prayerfully searched the scriptures and was sensitive to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. The, this attribute is seen in a quote from him in 1921. And I want you to listen carefully. Who knows, by looking a little deeper into the Word of God, that we may find something that we can do to add strength and power, as well as prestige. This is our method of procedure. 
This is the object of holding our assemblies annually. And every year finds new minds opened up, producing their glittering gold and glorious truths. We have been loudly criticized because we have made so many changes during the past 16 years. You know, for a while, that's something we forgot. We thought that all that we had inherited in our own day had always been. But he says they were being criticized in 1921 for having made so many changes in the last 16 years. That ought to teach us a lesson, isn't it? But this is one of the principles of the great church of God, continuing with his words. We did not know it all when we started, so we obligated ourselves to search for truth and walk in the light as it is revealed through the Holy Ghost and the Holy Scriptures. Those of us that are familiar with the growing literary field of Pentecostal scholarship find much being written today on what is called the fivefold gospel. Jesus as Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, Baptizer with the Holy Ghost, and Coming King. But in his 1913 work, it is evident that A.J. was familiar with the extant Christian teaching of his day. It included, included in his section on healing, he wrote this in 1913. To accept Christ in these days means to take him as Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer with the Holy Ghost, Healer, and Coming King. You hear any echoes? He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And then he quotes, he writes in brackets, 1 John 3, 8. Later in the book, he refers to the names of reformers and leaders generally associated with certain doctrines. He mentions Martin Luther for justification, John Wesley for sanctification, A.B. Simpson uh, for divine healing, and William J. Seymour for the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. According to some sources, A.B. Simpson is credited with coining the phrase fourfold gospel. Of course, after the phrase initial evidence, as it relates to spirit baptism, which is sometimes attributed to Charles Parham of Topeka, Kansas, although there's always a little bit of debate among the scholars about that. After that phrase came along, references to the fivefold gospel then became very common in holiness and Pentecostal circles, those that, of course, had accepted the baptism of the Holy Ghost as a fifth role for Jesus. Uh, my point is that the connectivity of the Christian gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, spans many generations and indeed centuries and millennia and is indicative of the superintendency of the Holy Spirit. He is the superintendent in the kingdom of God and in the mission of God. God is at work in all his world, through his Holy Spirit. If we read John 16, 17 to 11, we certainly will catch that. And he is at work even when we cannot connect it all together at any given point in history. Our first assembly delegates perhaps could not fully conceive what they were a part of. So sometimes they tended to treat their holiness, uh, or rather their horizons, as the ultimate of what God was doing. In, he has an eternal view, an eternal scope. So in the tradition of the Bible, we are so glad for those things that God chose to renew and revive in the church through us, but in keeping committed as our forefathers were to walk in the light, help me to the best of our knowledge and ability. This way, we can follow our Lord to his limitless horizons and not limit him to ours. Let this be our legacy in the tradition of our forefathers. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand together again and sing something that is familiar. <laughs> There's great familiarity in the words to this song. But I encourage you that we're not overcomers because of familiarity or our awareness of things. We're overcomers when we can take that familiarity and turn it into testimony. Amen. May this song be words of testimony as we continue our meeting together. Let's sing together. I have heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins
he will help us to do what he's asked us to do. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Can anybody quote that besides me? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by the elders obtain a good report. Amen. Hebrews 11 is called the faith chapter. Is that not right? Amen. And I would like for us for just a few moments to think about these 21 people who was at this first assembly. You think they might be looking down upon us today Amen. and saying, thank God you still remember? Amen. You still remember what we had no idea was going to happen or what was going to culminate from all that we did, but we were following the leading of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. We were following what He asked them to do. And Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about that <coughs> field of faith. It talks about, by faith, Abraham when he was tried. Jacob blessed Joseph. Moses, by faith, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He forsook Egypt. He kept the Passover. The Red Sea, they walked through on dry land. Amen. And Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And if you read on in the 11th chapter, there's a whole lot more that is said there about faith. The faith of this one, and the faith of that one, and the faith of the other one. And that, down to verse 32, this is what the writer says. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me. Yes. We could go on and on and on and on and on and on about all those who have gone before us and who have kept the faith. Amen. Amen. Amen? This is what the Scripture says in Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And I would like to think in my imagination, excuse me for using imagination, but I would like to think that these pictures on this wall the things that have happened in the past are witnesses, testimonies to what God is doing for us now and in the future. Uh, in our day, or in my day, let's put it this way, and my personal cloud of witness could have included A.J. Tomlinson, although I never met him, M.A. Tomlinson, and I thought back on that, the assembly that Brother Tomlinson was appointed general overseer, he had pastored a church for six months. That was his experience. Uh -huh. You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? God has a sense of humor. And he used him for this church to grow and to prosper and to be what it is today. If I go a little bit further, I go down to people like C.R. Payne and D.H. Queener, L.S. Rhodes. D.H. Queener, when I was a boy, used to stay in my house in Kansas. My mother and father took care of every evangelist and every preacher that come through, and I slept anywhere I could find to sleep. And my mom fried chicken. And she went out to get some chicken, and Doreen Queener happened to be looking out the window as she went out to get the chicken. And she got him, and she laid the neck of the chicken on a stump and chopped his head off, and then she stood on the chicken. Doreen Queener told her she was the cruelest woman he ever seen that would not let a chicken flop. Would not let a chicken flop as it's dying. But she was known for her fried chicken. If you go a little bit farther, there's a man that touched my life in a very unique way. C.T. Davidson. I was working in our church publishing house for five and a half years and I went back to pastoring. And not long after going back to pastoring, I received a letter. I didn't even know that C.T. Davidson knew who I was. But he wrote a letter to me and said, I want to thank you for your service to the publishing house. That letter changed my life to know that somebody was watching what we were doing. So I would say he would be included in the cloud of witnesses, wouldn't you? Then I can go on down. As my personal witness, I would have Howard Thomas, my first overseer in Kansas. I would have Boyd Thornton. M.T. Lincas, Elwood Matthews, and on and on and on and on we go. Of those who have already gone before us and are now in that great cloud of witnesses looking down upon us to see how we're living for the 
Lord. See how we're trusting Him today as they trusted Him. Amen. 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 If we could just for a moment see the sacrifices that many of these people made. They, they didn't drive new cars. Uh, they didn't wear new clothes. But they trusted God for everything Amen. that they had. Amen. Amen? Amen? I ought to get some amens out of this group here. Amen. There's some elder ones here that's probably trusted God for things, you know. Uh, I did that, and I'm not bragging about that, but I was so thrilled to be in the state of Pennsylvania and be the state evangelist. And the overseer, Brother Boyd Thornton, or Brother Lincoln at that time, had uh, asked me to speak at the minister's convention, and I spoke, and I had one suit and a sport coat and a pair of slacks to match the sport coat. So after that was over, my wife and I went to the laundromat because in Pennsylvania, I thought going to Pennsylvania, everything would be modern. But nothing was modern. No running water, outhouses. It was wonderful. I was raised in Kansas City. I knew about all those good things. But those things I went through. So we went to the laundromat and I bent it over to pick up the basket. And my wife said, hold it a minute. You've got something white all over the back of your pants. Well, it wasn't anything white. I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> you show it to you. I understand? But I was so proud of the fact that I had one suit and a sport coat and a pair of slacks. Because I was going to evangelize. I was going to take the world for Jesus in Pennsylvania. And your cloud of witness says, may be different than mine. But again, the writer of Hebrews says, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, declares those of chapter 11 have paved the way before us and for them, the Hebrews, and before us and admonishes us to lay aside every weight. Oh, yeah, Brother Parker, you need to preach on that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> lay aside every weight, the weight of worldly possessions. Aren't you thankful for God? what God blessed you with? God has blessed us, folks. Amen. I think back to that church, first church I pastored. You know, they said, now, Brother Parker, there's a warm morning stove in the middle of the living room floor, and you, you fire it with coal. And at night you bank it. They might have been saying, mumbling some foreign language to me. I had never banked a fire in my life. Every morning I would get up and the fire was out, so I'd have to start a new fire. Eventually I learned to bank it. But then we modernized and we got a used coal furnace that we put in the basement. The, the wooden, the dirt floor basement of the, church, of the parsonage. We put a used coal furnace in there. I come home from a youth rally. I looked in that thing, and I thought, there is no fire. And so I took a can of paint thinner, and I went, oh, and it went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I had no eyebrows, no eyelashes. And thank goodness I was wearing a crew cut because, you know, you understand? These are things we went through. My wife had been raised in the city. And uh, the only where I could get water was to go across to the neighbor, the only neighbor I had, by the way, go across to her, out behind her house was a well. And I'd go out there with a, a kettle of water and prime the pump and pray, oh God, please let the water come. Please, God, let the water come. And I'd carry two buckets to the house as I was going to a job somewhere. And, uh, and I'd say, please don't waste this water. <laughs> it, it, we didn't have a sink that drained, but that was about it. You understand? But all these people have gone before me. Right. And I've, I've thought about, I was, you gave me a long time to think about this. And I was thinking about that little church, Huey, Pennsylvania. You, if you go there, it's still there, by the way. And uh, we took our daughter there when she was about 13, 14 years old. She said, surely, Mom and Dad, you didn't live here. But we did, and we were happy. And, uh, you know, God's blessed us. I thank you for every blessing. Yes, but I never want to get to the place where worldly possessions stand in the way of my walk with the Lord. Amen. Because there is a whole cloud of witnesses looking down and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? You've put me, you've put that before me. 
You've done this before me. No, I don't want to be there. I don't want to do that. I want God to know that I'm still at 81 years old, still following Him the best I know how. Amen. It's been rather confusing when you retire after some 53 years of the ministry. <coughs> But I'm still trying to please the Lord. How about you? Because there's a cloud of witnesses up there. Yours may be different than mine. You could name people in your life that have affected you and done things. And please excuse me if I cough. I'm not going to die. The last I knew I was in fairly good health. But when I fast, my voice goes. I don't know why, but it does. And we just closed the fast, did we not? And uh, so I'm having trouble with that and I may cough. But he said, let us lay aside every word. The rich young ruler went away sadly because the scripture said he had great riches. Imagining hidden, imaginary hindrances. The, the scripture talks about when they were building the walls of Jerusalem that the discouraged laborers told Hezekiah that, you understand what I'm saying? That the walls were not able to be built because there was too much rubble. Oh, Brother Parker, we are never going to get there because there's just too much wrong going on in the church. Too much wrong. But they built the walls. Amen. 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 And what God is looking at us to do is to, to be those who will not let imaginary hindrances stand in our way. Amen. 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 And the sin which doth so easily beset us. I thought a lot about that because you don't want to preach to a bunch of preachers and, and people who've lived for the Lord for years about sin because we don't sin. <coughs> Clear my throat. We don't sin. But the scriptures plainly says, to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Is that not right? He didn't stutter about that. He he didn't mutter about that. He made it very plain. Yes. That if you know to do something right and you let things stand in your way. Sins of omission. These are things that harm us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Patience to accept His will. Patience to have endurance. We faint not. Striving for Him. Keeping the faith. Dreaming. Dreaming, reaching forth. I cannot, <coughs> in my imagination, understand all that we've done over the years. <coughs> we went to these countries. We won people to the Lord. We've established churches in these countries. Somebody said, oh, but Brother Parker, they're not like us. Well, their skin may not be our color, but I think they're like us. They love the Lord just like you do. Right. Amen? Amen? They love the Lord just like you do. I went to... Uh, was allowed to go to Jamaica, a Jamaica mom, <laughs> and I went to Jamaica, and my goodness, those people worship the Lord. That's right. They worship the Lord. I, I couldn't understand the word they were saying because they were singing in their, their tongue, but I could sure worship the Lord with them because when the Spirit got to move, you didn't have to have an interpreter to That's know right. what that was. Yeah. You understand Amen. what I'm saying? All these witnesses are standing Amen. before us, looking down on us. Amen. <coughs> I, I think of Elwood Matthews, one of my mentors. Brother Matthews would put me on an assembly program and he'd say, Joe, that's a nickname by the way, not part of my name. He'd say, Joe, no sci-fi, I'm giving you 10 minutes. Get a hit the floor preaching and in 10 minutes, stop. What is he wanting from me? But I learned. Those people blessed me. Those people gave me wisdom and understanding. And I thank God for every one of them. <clears throat> and I look up and I say, You know, Lord, why have you allowed me to live this long? Because they've already gone before. But I am thankful that God has allowed us to live here. And he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Yes. Hebrews, I think, or the writer of Hebrews had something in mind there. He said, we're not looking unto those that are in the cloud of witnesses. No. Because they are there. Yeah, they may be cheering us on with their testimony of what they accomplished. We're not looking to an organization or a body of believers as we commemorate this first assembly here. We're not looking to that. We're, 
Sometimes we've got to get our eyes focused on Jesus. Right. He is the author and Amen. the finisher Amen. of our faith. Amen. He is the one we can look to in time of need. He's the one when we don't understand, He will help us to understand. That's Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Aren't you glad you know Him? Aren't you glad you know Him? But find us faithful is the name of the song. We're pilgrims on a journey of a narrow road. And those who have gone before us lying the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives are stirring testimony to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who have gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and the children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. And let all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fires of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead us to believe. And the lives we live inspire them. Oh, man. 